artistic activity and to facilitate the digital reflection both bilaterally that is Germany Korea or multilaterally which other European countries or even between finally and that project that we did with the Solar Panel Snowden Archives. It's very nice to see uh, you here in this late night or late evening session. I think we will have to cope with the fact that there's so much in parallel going on that some people will be allowed to trickle in uh, in the next uh, half an hour or so, for good or bad here, because we're getting started into a very, um, yeah, a discussion that uh, I think uh, is extremely uh, current and uh, important to have and to have a continuation of something that uh, has been running also at Transmediale and other forums for um, uh, many years of course, but specifically as we're dealing with the Snowden archives for a, for a few years here. Um, it's a collaboration, this event, and there's many frameworks that I, I need to mention. Um, um, it's of course a collaboration with the uh, journal Berliner Gazette, and it's part of a series of activities uh, called Diving into the Snowden Archives. In turn, these are part of the New Year theme that Christian Wosnicki definitely will talk uh, to you about, Tacit Futures. Um, he will be the moderator of this session with uh, our guests. Uh, before I introduce Christian and ask him to take place here at the lectern to introduce the session in full, I'd like to t take the opportunity to really thank you and to thank the Berliner Gazette for bringing this discussion and for bringing the workshop tomorrow to Transmedial and for uh, being able to have this collaboration with you. Um, because Berliner Gazette I regard as a really great alternative voice in the German media landscape, which brings a critical perspective on various digital transformations, similar to the goal of Transmediale. Um, the topic, uh, speaking of, about the digital transformations, uh, speaking about the, what to do with the enormous quantities of digital information generated by networked information architecture, or at least distributed in them, um, is of course, one of the topics here. The case of the data leaked by whistleblower Edward Snowden in 2013 is one also where it became evident um, how widespread the abuse of this information is by corporations and governments. Of course, long suspected or known by actors such as the one participating in this panel. But um, in this very dark world emerging as reality from the specter of mass surveillance, the Berlina Gazette, the Berlina Gazette calls for a commoning of the Snowden files. I think this carries a very sympathetic message where data or this data is also seen as an opportunity for uh, education in perhaps more responsible data politics, for engaging civil society in resisting confirm confirmation to such invasive data collections. So how this is going to be explored by the participants and the different initiatives represented here, I will leave to Christian uh, to further introduce. I'd like to introduce you first though um, and say um, Christian is the editor-in-chief of the publisher of Berlin Gazette, which he founded in 1999. He has worked as a journalist in the field of uh, culture, society, internet, for the Japan Times and for Wired Japan, uh, as a correspondent for Specs and Telepolis. And since 1999, he is based here in uh, Berlin as a media producer and journalist. Um, 
we have, uh, besides the workshops tomorrow, also a session called um, Let's Talk About Whistleblowing at 8 uh, on Saturday. I hope I'm right now. I don't have the schedule in front of me. Otherwise, look it up, where you can also post your questions in advance to the session. Uh, if you go to transmediale.de, I'm mentioning this because I think the topic is quite related to what we're going to do here tonight. Christian, the lectern is yours. And, well, welcome. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, um, the entire Transmediale team, especially Melvin Neumann, for working with us. In the near future, an estimated number of 700 million people will lose their homes due to climate change and wars. Many of them will escape to the global north. Already today, this mechanism poses pressing challenges. The democratic states in Europe, for instance, display ever bigger problems with preserving access to existential resources and human rights. Not only for those who now escape or migrate to Europe in great numbers, but also for those who are already here. And we have to ask, can our democracies contain the spreading precariousness as well as the increasingly intransparent control of data and human traffic? The collective action and self-organization by refugees and citizens of a new Willkommenskultur are visibly revitalizing the democratic project. Yet such seminal developments are overshadowed by the incidents in Paris and Cologne and by images scandalizing the excess of migration movements. Irrational reflexes are the consequence. A rising populism of anxiety suggests that what's spreading in Europe today is neither a humanitarian crisis nor a crisis of democracy, but actually a crisis of security and that we should not call for humanity and democracy, but instead for more police and total control. In fact, that we should invest more into the new form of power which has been unleashed by the war on terror, a power that confronts potential threats and projects futures which may never occur, but nonetheless militarizes what is yet to happen. Ultimately, a power that renders democracy into a matter of algorithmic logistics. However, rather than buying into this power, it's high time to question and challenge it. To begin with, we should acknowledge that this new form of power is already becoming an integral part of our everyday lives. Aren't we more and more depending on big data-driven predictions in finance and epidemiology, labor, and climate policy, geopolitics and advertising? And are we increasingly believing that technologies of prediction are the perfect early warning system for general security? Trend researchers diagnose the spreading of apocalyptic barbitry, which actually can be described as a culture of immunization against uncertain futures and also against population groups that are singled out as threats. But do we really need technocratic debates, or is it enough to sense that the biggest threats are neither outside nor embodied by strangers, but inside the architecture of our democracies? Moreover, that we need to differentiate between insecurity produced by growing precariousness on the one hand and security threats caused by terror on the other, and that we need to investigate how precarious conditions are actually causing terror. What does it take for us to imagine and build a democracy that our wannabe post-colonial and desperately mobile times deserve? A democracy without borders or a democracy in movement? Or can democracy dedicate itself to universal equality while still being confined to national borders? In any case, we should realize that we have already started to renegotiate the very basics of social justice and sociality in general when facing the growing number of refugees in Europe. 
And the big question is whether and how we will manage to eventually collaborate on a common future. A future in which the freedom of movement is regaining a common horizon. More specifically, a future in which the democratic control of movement, whether it concerns humans or data, becomes the vanishing point of our struggles. It is against this backdrop that the transmediale cooperation that Berliner Gazette is enjoying here continues the work that the Berliner Gazette has been doing last year on the Commons, and we are launching our new annual project under the title Tested Futures basically today. The title of this project at the Transmediale is Diving into the Snowden Archives. The Snowden Archives encompass documents leaked by former NSA subcontractor Edward Snowden and then published in part by major newspapers including The Guardian, The New York Times, The Washington Post and Der Spiegel. These revelations initiated global debates about the role of secret services in democracies, citizen rights in the age of digital networks, the role and definition of national security, the state of big data, and the industries of prediction. Thereby, the debates directed our attention towards an increasingly intransparent control of data traffic and human traffic, a drama that concerns Laura Poitras, who was repeatedly detained at borders, that concerns Edward Snowden, who is no longer free to move, a drama eventually which, as the work of those two people shows, is equally taking place in the realm of data technologies. By disclosing the inner workings of a clandestine data industry state surveillance complex, the Snowden archives represent a kind of collective subconscious, something that society was never meant to learn about itself, its past, present, and future. In that sense, the Snowden files can be seen as a message from children from an era that is yet to be received, as Kim ki Dux has said in a different context. Yet the interpretations of even the published documents remain unfinished due to their cryptic language and specialized information. And only a small percentage have been published so far. We can expect more revelations to emerge in the future, though it may take decades before they all enter the public domain. In this sense, the Snowden archives not only represent a repressed awareness of the design of our social and political present, they also represent an awareness yet to come, provided we can develop the tools and capacities to decode and share them. Actually, this would be a very concrete way to question and challenge the new form of power that organizes its capacities in order to preempt putatively dangerous movements by humans and bits alike. So, how can we render this awareness and knowledge into our comments? How can we incorporate it as a vital part of our common history and common future? A future in which the freedom of movement should regain a common horizon, a future in which the democratic control of movement, whether it concerns data or humans, becomes our vanishing point. In order to go about this huge task, the cooperation between Berliner Gazette and Transmediale stages a panel and workshops. On Friday morning, which is tomorrow, the day-long workshop Connecting Snowden Archives brings together pioneering archivists of the Snowden documents from North America and Europe for the first time. It enables them to present their work in depth in order to facilitate deeper learning from processes. Additional guests who do research or run projects related to Snowden Archive initiatives will provide ideas about how such an archive could be used for explorations and projects by journalists, researchers, activists, and librarians. In today's panel, first of all, we will explore Cryptome Org, which is considered the precursor of digital leaking platforms and which has been the first organization to start systematically collecting Snowden documents. Moreover, we will dive into projects such, such as the Snowden Document Search, the Snowden Digital Surveillance Archive, and the Snowden Archive in a Box. 
bringing together pioneering archivists of the files leaked by Snowden. This panel is, at least to me, a culturally significant, a culturally significant world premiere aiming to reflect the motivations and challenges experienced by each initiative. I'm very happy to open now the floor and to give it to John Young and Deborah Natsios from Cryptome.org, New York. Thank you very much. And please welcome Deborah and John. Am I, are we on? Yes. We are absolutely delighted to accept the invitation of Transmediale and the Berliner Gazette to join you from New York today. And we are premiering at this time a new work that was inspired by this conclave to be shown for the first time in public here that deals with issues raised by Christian and the prospect, the imminent prospect of this group of impressive researchers that addresses issues of the Snowden Archive in a genealogical and archaeological way, providing a context for it that goes beyond the periodization of our particular moment, hopefully opening up some horizons, and you will recognize this very architectural structure as playing a role from representing the ethos of its moment of construction. Following at the Q&A, we can discuss further after we have heard from our esteemed colleagues here. Thank you. In 1950, during the early years of the Cold War, Rand Corporation scientists made what some argue is the most influential discovery in game theory since its inception, the so-called Prisoner's Dilemma, a classic paradigm of conflict. The Prisoner's Dilemma considers the scenario of one side gaining security at the expense of the common good. We will play the game with two military intelligence agents who are separated by 60 years of geopolitical and technological history. As a spy, it seems to me spies probably look a lot more like Ed Snowden and a lot less like James Bond these days. Well, it's no secret that uh, the U.S. tends to get more and better intelligence out of computers nowadays than they do out of people. Um, I was trained as a spy in sort of the traditional sense of the word in that I lived and worked.
Captain Nikolai Kokloff, former MVD agent, tells a press conference of his murder mission for the Kremlin. He relates his appointment to assassinate an anti-communist leader in Frankfurt, Georgi Okolovich, to whom he confided the plot instead of carrying it out. An American weapons expert examines the lethal weapons provided for the assassination. Cigarette cases containing electrical firing devices propel a cyanide-coated bullet into the victim as a fake cigarette is offered. Kokloff tells the conference that he was dissuaded by his wife and asked the free world's help in saving her from red vengeance. It is a startling ending to a chapter in the never-ceasing struggle across the Iron Curtain as would-be assassin and near victim shake hands in the safety of political asylum.
I was trained as a spy in sort of the traditional sense of the word in that I lived and worked undercover overseas, uh, pretending to work in a job that I'm not, uh, and even being assigned a name that was not mine.
trained as a spy. It seems to me spies probably a look a lot more like Ed Snowden and a lot less like James Bond Copeland. these days. Uh, well, it's no secret that uh, uh, the U.S. tends to get more and better intelligence out of computers nowadays than they do out of people. Um, I was trained as a spy in sort of the traditional sense of the word, in that I lived and worked undercover overseas, uh, pretending to work in a job that I'm not. Uh, and even being assigned a name that was not mine. Now, the government might deny... Thank you very much, um, John Young, Deborah Natsios, uh, for this um, great um, um, audiovisual um, presentation, which is um, a world premiere in itself and was specifically made for this event. Is um, Andrew Clement from the University of Toronto um, is our next speaker. The stage is yours. Thank you, Christian. <laughs> Thank you, Christian, <laughs> and all the people in um, Berliner Gazette who have made this possible, and of course to Transmedial. So it's a pleasure for me to um, join um, with uh, 
those who you see on the stage here who have been working over the last uh, couple of years to try to make the Snowden documents, the ones that are published, much more available than they have been. And what I'd like to do is to, um, if you can show my slides. Um, okay, good. Um, uh, to, to give you a bit of an introduction, a brief introduction, um, and also to put them in a bit of uh, context. Uh, uh, and if you have a device that uh, connects to Wi-Fi, you can follow along in a way um, if, uh, by looking at some of these documents as I speak. Um, so the Snowden Archive is an SSID that you should find on your devices. And if you go to the Five Eyes or NSA or any agency or any URL of your choice, um, you will um, encounter the Snowden um, Archive um, of the documents, the 500 and plus documents that um, are, uh, have been uh, published. Uh, so if we... It, it's a remarkably short time ago, but it seems like a long time. But in uh, June 6th of 2013, as the second day of the publication of the documents that uh, Snowden uh, turned over to the reporters in the Mira Hotel in, um, in, um, in Hong Kong. And um, this um, particular image must have struck quite a few people as uh, as alarming and, sh and shocking. This is the list of the partner organizations, and you can see their logos across the top, and you know all, all but one of them will be very familiar uh, to you, um, who had, uh, were cooperating with the NSA to provide what was referred to as direct access to their, to their databases. Um, uh, this really sort of uh, let the cat out of, out of the bag. Uh, for me, as a, as a a surveillance researcher who had been looking um, at uh, surveillance issues and privacy uh, for some time, um, this was um, was shocking, but but not entirely surprising because uh, uh, authors like uh, James Bamford had been writing since the early 1980s about the National Security Agency and how it was attempting to tap into everybody's communication. Um, the, the image that, uh, that really struck me, um, and which I'll talk a little bit more about, um, is this that uh, was appeared um, a month later in June 23rd. Um, and uh, this is uh, called the Worldwide Signal Intelligence Defense Cryptologic Platform. And it shows all the various ways in which the NSA uh, was worldwide capturing signals of various kinds. Um, I just want to draw attention to a couple of these. The, the, the first is um, the regional um, uh, do, dots. These are um, uh, telecom carriers that were working with the, C, uh, the, the NSA, willingly or not, to provide taps right into their um, uh, networks, in, into the internet backbone to provide uh, the feeds of all of the traffic that was passing through them. And then there's the large cable um, accesses and intercepts, which works in, the, in a very similar way. Um, this was particularly striking to those who follow um, the, the uh, uh, surveillance and the whistleblowers because it um, demonstrated that the claims that were made by a former AT&T technician, Mark Klein, who blew the whistle in 2006 on the presence of splitter operations. These are fiber optic splitters embedded in the main switches in the San Francisco switching center that copied the entire traffic of, uh, that was passing through that point and uh, between AT&T and other carriers or uh, internally in the AT&T system. Um, and this was, uh, these signals were, trans were sent to the secret room 641A on the, on the sixth floor of that switching center. Um, and you see there a rather ominous building in the center of, um, of San Francisco that has no windows. Um, so around that time, um, there, was, there were 40 plus court cases, there was a, a rash of media coverage, but it died down very quickly. And then after 2008, with the passing of the, the FISA Amendments Act, um, also called the Telecom Immunity Act, the story went away because none of the court cases could proceed the, you know, on various grounds, and, and with, with that act, the telecom companies were off the hook. Um, so I, among others, was concerned that this story was a, was a big one and shouldn't go away, and tried to make it more tangible to people um, that 
your data was passing through these points. The internet is not a cloud. It's not just ethereal and out there and sort of everywhere and nowhere. Um, it is constituted through these few critical switching points at the center of big cities. And, um, and we estimated that in the United States, um, 18 cities um, would uh, pr comprise enough um, sites of surveillance to basically capture all of that uh, data. Uh, we developed this website to cap to, to encourage, encourage people to submit their own what they're called trace routes, the paths that the internet, um, their own internet traffic ta uh, takes across the net. Uh, then we would map them, and we could map them in coincidence with these um, these uh, NSA uh, sites. And uh, what we were able to show um, is uh, that um, indeed, from our data, that uh, in this case, it's probably not this high, but 99% of the internet traffic that we had in our databases that we, we you know, crowdsourced in this way went through at least one of those 18 uh, cities. So in effect, um, with just a handful of sites, um, the NSA could capture the entire internet traffic within the United States. Um, now, I'm a Canadian, and we were concerned about what this meant um, inside uh, Canada and whether our traffic went. And this is the route that packets took from my office at the University of Toronto across to a, to a site across the street at the provincial government. It's the Ontario Student Assistance Program. Um, so students had some interest in this. And um, for a period of, of six years we've been following this, um, that traffic went via the United States uh, through uh, Chicago and, and New York. Um, and um, let's see if this is still working. Um, yes, so this is a video that we made and then um, uh, Dr. Dr. Cory Doctorow um, uh, clipped it, um, a bit of the video, and put it on an endless loop. And this shows you the path um, that the packets take um, to get across the street. Um, I won't go into the details as to why that is so. It's not just because the NSA wants to capture everything in that way. They could capture it in other ways, but because of the way that the telecom companies interact with each other. Anyway, so that is a revealing example of what we call boomerang traffic. It happens in, in Europe. Uh, Germans are concerned about a lot of their traffic going, say, via London, where the GCHQ um, is, uh, can capture it, and so on. Um, and here's just the set of routes um, from Canadians to their federal government uh, that passes through the United States. So that seems a, a bit odd, and this is barely a sample. So this was the context. So when Snowden came out with these, with these documents and these revelations, um, the, my immediate question and, and um, other researchers uh, as well were interested in, well, who are these companies? Um, because they're hidden behind code words, this prism a case that we mentioned, I mentioned a moment ago, they, they named the companies there, but otherwise they're hidden behind very obscure, um, very odd um, uh, keyword, uh, code names. Um, so who were they and where were they doing this? Um, so that was the impetus for creating the archive. I looked out um, at the repositories. Cryptome has a collection. Um, you know, they keep up to date. They've got ones from the day before yesterday, I believe. Um, the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, they collected repositories, so they listed them all, but you couldn't search them. So you couldn't look across and see all of the documents, say, that had to do with the PRISM program or that had to do with this cryptologic platform. Um, you couldn't follow a code word across them. So I, mean, I was surprised that, that there were none uh, had been developed um, at that point, and because I'm in a school that has archive uh, program, and I had some talented archive students, I said, um, why don't you build an, an archive of these documents? And they took to this with, with relish, and within a year, they had developed um, this, the, the archive of all of these documents with searching aids and, and finding aids, um, indexes, and so on. Um, now, there was other motivations, of course, for this. Um, the, the wider project is to help um, everyone, researchers, um, re uh, academics, uh, journalists, um, but also lay researchers, um, people who are interested and curious about this extraordinary phenomenon, to um, gain access to themselves. The, the Snowden documents um, are, I, I maybe don't I need to say this uh, here, but I mean, are of, of 
of historic importance in shedding an unprecedented light um, into the sort of deep state, the, the, the hidden state um, that uh, conducts um, its, a, its affairs so secretly but, but in, in some ways so consequentially for us. So we needed to be able to look at that. And also um, these brave whistleblowers, Snowden, but also others from the NSA, uh, Bill Binney, uh, Tom Drake, Kirk Wiebe, and also Jessalyn Radak, who was involved in that. Um, uh, these archives are testimony to, to, to their contributions here. So a year ago, uh, March, um, we, we launched publicly the, the archive. Um, it was broadcast on the Canadian um, Broadcasting Corporation live webcasting and Edward Snowden um, uh, appeared by, uh, by vi video connection to answer questions and um, uh, with the help of the Canadian Journalist for Free, Free Expression. Um, so we were very proud to be able to present this. Um, and, uh, and so far, there's, we've got you know, lots of, of, of interest. Um, just to give you a brief flavor for how it works, um, it's, a, it's a very old school kind of archival um, uh, collection. So you have various search terms. I, th this is the search term um, Germany here. It, it will find it in wherever it appears in any of the documents and it shows up as coming out 175 times with more than 50 documents matching that query and here is just um, uh, one of them. I pick more or less at random the NSA signal intelligence presence in Germany. So you might want to check that out. Um, you can do it now as I say um, th through that um, to your device. Um, uh, so uh, another one is in line with what I was interested in was what about these telecom companies. Um, in last summer, um, the New York Times um, published um, this document called uh, NSA C uh, Special Source Operations, various documents. It, it combined them and wrote um, this story, um, AT&T helped the US spy on internet on vast scale. Um, it also mentions the other um, large um, US telecom provider Verizon. This is a map in that collection um, of, uh, you know, of, of key sites, um, but under the code name Stormbrew. Um, the, the code name for the AT&T was Fairview, and the reporters in that case um, sort of did the forensic analysis by, co by coordinating and comparing the documents in the file, in, uh, you know, the Snowden documents, um, for incidents that happened under the name of those code names with events like uh, an earthquake in Japan that severed the AT&T link or um, and so they could, you know, they could align those dates and, and figure out that Fairview was, was um, AT&T, Stormbrew was Verizon, but there are a lot of other ones um, uh, still to be figured out. Here is the map of the Fairview sites, which it's difficult to see here, but map very closely um, with the 18 sites that we had um, identified earlier. So we felt, as researchers, we felt gratified by that, but of course alarmed that uh, it was going on at such a scale. Um, we've begun mapping those um, with um, and some work with Bill Binney, um, who has plotted the locations of all of the AT&T facilities and Verizon facilities around the world, and now we can do a, you know, a, a, a mashup showing those locations. And, um, and in particular, there's one shown in, in Germany, and this is the AT&T um, uh, interception site, uh, suspected interception site in Frankfurt. Um, you can recognize from the aerial view that this is, a, um, is an internet switching site, so there's a huge amount of, of air conditioning and power supplies on the roof and visible. This is one of the signatures of this. So you can track these down um, to the building. But there's a, a vast amount of other information um, buried in these um, documents um, which uh, remain to be un, um, unlocked. Um, as, as Christian was saying earlier, these are, um, these, this, is to, this is coming, it's a tacit future. The, these can be uh, derived from those documents um, uh, if you can work at it. But now that they're out there, we hope that you will um, take some interest and uh, we'd be very glad to help with you, help you do this. Um, this Snowden archive is a 
uh, work in progress. If you try it out, you'll see that it's a bit clunky. It's, as I say, it's sort of old school. We're moving to new platforms, but we'd welcome your feedback on this. Um, we're also looking to work with others who can help us follow those research questions, like who is the carrier um, that's uh, behind the code name lithium, for instance, or vice versa. Um, one of the major international carriers, backbone carriers, is called uh, Level 3. They're the largest in the world. Um, you may not have heard about them, but they are the ones who carry most of the internet traffic around the world. Um, you know, who, you know, which, which code names uh, do, are they associated with? And we're also looking for mirror sites. And by that, we mean sites who will host this web service say in a university or in a library, um, for a couple of reasons. I mean, one is, is to make it more available. Uh, one is to, uh, as, a, as, as is common with mirroring, to make it more robust. If one gets shut down, um, then the other is still uh, available. And also, it will protect um, uh, from exposure of internet traffic, say students who are working on projects, um, if they do it on the, the, camp, on the university campus, and if they campus has secured its networks against these kinds of intrusion, at least there's some better protection. Um, so for various reasons, um, we, we're looking for, for mirror sites. But another more radical way of, of being able to ensure that you can access this network or, or, or this, um, this archive without exposing your traffic to the interception um, by the NSA is to actually take it off the net and put it into a box, um, the Snowden archive in a box, and um, I'll turn it over to Evan Light. Here. Evan Light from Concordia University in Montreal. Um, thank you very much, Andrew Clement. Please welcome Evan Light. So thank you to Christian and uh, Berlin Gazeta and Transmedia for having me back in Berlin. I was here in October for the Uncommons uh, conference. Um, I'm a privacy researcher at the Mobile Media Lab at Concordia University in Montreal. Um, this whole project of the, the archive in a box came to mind last year, uh, shortly after the, the web version launched. Um, I thought, I want to use this, but I don't want to get tracked while I use it. And so I started thinking about, how, okay, how do you do mass surveillance without being surveilled? At the same time, I wanted to look at the, the, some of the issues that WikiLeaks had, with especially the WikiLeaks, as well as the WikiLeaks embargo, where the U.S. government pressured um, PayPal and numerous credit card companies to cut off donations to WikiLeaks. And so they were essentially shut down for a long time. Um, and tried to BitTorrent a one terabyte file of their entire archive, which nobody was really able to download. So how do you circumvent attempts to crush dissent like that or like den denial of service attacks, um, things that the internet is prone to? Um, thirdly, I, how do you do that and also teach people what surveillance really looks like? Um, my answer to the first two questions was just get the fuck off the internet. But how do you do that? And for me, it's increasingly the idea of using really small computers to communicate amongst small groups of people. So if you pull out your phone or your laptop or a tablet or whatever, you'll see a Wi-Fi network in here called Snowden Archive. There are lots of Raspberry Pis scattered around this building that look like this, and they're in other forms, a couple of suitcases around. Um, so almost anywhere in this building you'll, for the week, you'll see the Snowden Archive Wi-Fi. Um, if you go to any website, for instance, nsa.gov, you'll get to the archive that Andrew's talking about. Um, and nobody will see you do it. This is a, a picture of the, the first archive, um, which is this kind of suspicious black suitcase that I travel internationally with. It's right here, and several of you are using it now. The question of what surveillance looks like, though, was a little more complicated, and I wanted to somehow be able to show people what it, what it feels like to be surveilled. Um, and if we can get a camera on the suitcase, I'll show you that you're being watched. And this is what happens anybody, when anybody, anybody uses the internet. You're being watched quite transparently. This is all the conversations happening between people's phones and the servers in this suitcase right here. Just, well, actually, one of these that's in the suitcase. 
So surveillance, it, it's, it's something fairly easy to do. Um, this is done with maybe $60 worth of hardware and free open source software. Um, governments do this with billions of dollars um, and people who really have technical expertise. I'm not a programmer. I'm a former systems administrator, a privacy researcher. I did this without an incredible amount of technical expertise. This is another installation. This is, a, I guess, the first installation outside my boxes. Um, in October, I built this at Cambridge University um, at their, their ethics, the Big Data Research Group, asked me to build a stone archive for them. So they have one on sort of permanent installation that they use for teaching. Um, we're hoping that anybody else out there who wants to host an archive can do so too. Um, for the time being, if you email me, I'll send you a link to download the image. Um, you can buy a Raspberry Pi and an SD card for $70 um, and have an archive of your own, host it wherever you want. Um, potential users, human rights NGOs. Um, a colleague who until recently was at Privacy International explained to me how when he, he does legal research and he's building cases against GCHQ, he knows he's being surveilled. He knows that his search terms are being watched that they're paying attention to how he might be building legal arguments based on the kind of research he's doing online. And so this kind of thing could be really helpful. Again, academic researchers, like Andrew said, um, some people don't want to be surveilled. They don't want to be maybe pigeonholed into the idea that they're doing something wrong by doing their research. Um, I want it to be used as a, a tool for surveillance education, to be able to show people really what surveillance is. And so anybody out there who wants to do something, something similar can do it with one of these or build something like it. Um, also public art interventions, I've used this at, uh, at a couple of film festivals, um, doing sort of public installations on surveillance in places that people don't necessarily associate with mass surveillance. Um, and also libraries and public universities. We're working with a couple universities in Canada on um, setting this up as sort of a I guess, a, a way that you can get around bureaucracy and not have to ingest a bunch of taboo data into your university bureaucracy, but that you can just plug in a box and have it be there, um, like it is here in this building without anybody's really permission. Um, we've offered the stolen documents to everybody. And lastly, you can visit the archive online um, at stonearchive.cjfe.org. And if you want to talk about this or get a link to download the image, um, you can email me. You can find my PGP key online. That's all. Thank you very much, Evan. Um, we'll get back to you and any other of the things that have been presented so far in the Q&A section, which is coming up in about 10 minutes now. The last presentation is um, by MC McGrath. I'm very happy to um, give the floor to you. Please welcome MC McGrath. Does it work? Uh, It's a Windows computer, you have to understand. It's a So I'm MC and I work on Transparency Toolkit, making free software to help people collect and understand documents. And one of the projects that we worked on along with uh, Courage Foundation is a searchable database of all of the uh, published uh, Snowden documents. 
And I'd like to start off by talking about one of the dynamics that these documents bring up, and that's the challenge of keeping data private. It's really quite impossible to protect all of your data from all adversaries in all situations, all the time, forever. Uh, so instead, the goal when trying to keep information private is simply to raise the costs of accessing information, to make it take more time to access your data, to make it take more money to access your data, to make it take more computing power to access your data. And when these costs are higher than the price adversaries are willing to pay, then that's good. And when these costs are lower than the price adversaries are willing to pay, then your adversaries will pay the price and get your data. So in the case of groups like the NSA, that's groups that are very rich in terms of computing power, money, and time, the threshold for this price is very, very high. So if security is about raising costs, then I think transparency is in some ways the opposite. It's about lowering costs, about lowering barriers to accessing information. It's about making it so that more people can use data more easily. So it means specifically reducing the effort, the skills, and the resources that people need to access and understand and use data. Because information that requires expert knowledge or lots of advanced technical skills or monumental resources to use isn't really open or accessible. We need anyone to be able to use information. but. Unfortunately, just like it's impossible to have a perfectly secure system, I think it's also impossible to have a perfectly open and accessible system, but we can always continue to do better and lower these costs. One of the things that the uh, sort of revelations did a great job of was lowering these barriers to accessing information about surveillance programs. Before Snowden, the only people who knew about things like PRISM or XKeyScore or any of the other programs that came to light were people who had security clearance and worked for intelligence agencies and were reading these classified documents as part of their work. Uh, so usually people at Five Eyes intelligence agencies, but of course also their, uh, their adversaries have powerful intelligence agencies and probably had ways to get the data on their own as well. Um, so while the data was accessible to the NSA and their allies and their enemies, it wasn't accessible to the general public and even some people who are uh, supposed to be holding intelligence agencies accountable, like people in Congress. But now, thanks to Snowden and all of the journalists working on these documents, information is openly available on them on the public internet. And as a result of this, these programs are being contested in court and discussed in legislative bodies. And big tech companies and many other groups are starting to encourage the use of encryption much more broadly, which raises the cost for the NSA to get our data. So transparency starts to pave the way to accountability. But while well, the Snowden story showed the world that the NSA and other intelligence agencies and what they're doing, they didn't, it's not really an ideal situation for making the documents more accessible because there were hundreds of journalists working on these stories on many, many media organizations all over the world and they were just publishing these articles, these, they were publishing articles in the documents and they were posting the documents on the articles and these were just scattered everywhere um, and there wasn't a central location where they were being published and there wasn't a standard format. There are presentations, there are internal reports, there are wiki entries, there's all sorts of different formats and to make matters worse, there were some documents that came out over a period of time and were split up, like the PRISM revelations came out over several different stories and were split up into pieces, so it's difficult to get a full comprehensive list of some of the documents, and in some cases there were documents that would come out and there would be one version where there was one set of redactions and then later there another media organization would release another version with another set of redactions, so even if you found the document you were looking for, it might not be the right version or the most complete version. So in 2014, I started looking at this about a year after the revelations that are coming out, thinking there must be some repository of all of them in one place where all of these are easily accessible in a nice format. And I didn't really find much. There were a few repositories, but none of them were searchable. None of the documents couldn't, couldn't search through them or go through them easily. There were just lists of documents at best, often very incomplete with inconsistent criteria for getting the documents included. So 
I was a bit frustrated because this is one of the most important sets of documents, but there was no decent archive of them. And several journalists who were writing stories about the Snowden documents were also talking with me about how it was very challenging for them when they were looking for documents that they knew about that were published to even just find those documents so that they could reference them in their research. They couldn't find them. And how they wished that there had was a central repository for of published documents to make it easier to browse. So we started to build a searchable archive of all of the published Snowden documents to get them in a more consistent and accessible and searchable form. And we soon joined forces with Courage Foundation um, to work on this archive because they have this fantastic list of documents on their website. Um, and this is the Snowden document search that we made. Um, it lists all of the documents as well as various bits of related information. And of course, it's possible to search the full text, both all the fields where you can filter by various dates of release, things like that. So it is, for example, you could search for XQ score. What? <laughs> Apparently, it's uh, down. It was working, I mistyped it too. Anyways, I'm not sure what's wrong. It was working just fine before. Um, but normally you can see, you can see because it was already loaded when before it broke, um, all of the documents um, in, there's a list of all the documents and you can see the, um, there's bits of the text that were extracted, the um, summary of the documents um, when you, actually open a uh, document page, it, um, yeah, well you can't see it, but it has the uh, PDF of the documents themselves, the PDF of the documents themselves and the full text and all of the articles where you can view and browse that all in one place. Um, and there are also categories on the side, um, things like the agency that the document involves, uh, the code words mentioned in the document, the topic that the document discusses, uh, the countries mentioned. So um, you can see all the documents that mention Germany, for example, um, the SIGINT, the SIGINT's activities designators, the ideas for facilities used to collect signals intelligence. And some of these were automatically extracted, like SIGADs and classification headers, because those are in very standard formats in the documents. We automatically extracted them. And others uh, were manually tagged, like the document topic, and others are both automatically and manually tagged, like the countries mentioned. So since launching this in June, we've heard of a number of people using the certain document search in interesting ways. For example, we've heard of lawyers using it to find all documents to, that they need to uh, mention in a legal testimony, and we've heard of programmers using it to find technical details about different attacks that the NSA uses, like quantum insert attacks, um, so they can build software to detect them. And these use cases would be much, much harder if there was no central place to search through the full text of all the Snowden documents. But because we have this, normally when it's working, um, it, uh, people can just go to the archive and use it to search for the information that they need in a few minutes. Um, so with this, we've made a lot of progress towards an accessible, usable repository of documents. And this extends beyond just this one archive, too, because all of the tools that we made for this um, can have been and are um, being used to uh, build similar archives. And we've turned all of the software that we built to make this archive into free software that anyone can use for any set of documents to get them into a more accessible format. So we use, um, so we made tools so that people can easily extract text from documents, um, extract different metadata, process them, as well as a search software which we've used um, in a number of other document sets like uh, this one uses the same exact search software. Um, and this means that while it took us nearly a year to make the original Snowden document search with going through all the data and going and making the software and testing and it. it. Um, it's now possible for us to make similar archives in about a weekend. Um, and when it's possible to make archives of sets of documents like this very quickly and with little technical knowledge, uh, that's incredibly powerful. So I think it actually is the framework for making it easier to access sets of documents like this earlier on in the future so that we don't have to wait two years before we have searchable archives of something like this set of documents. Thanks.
I'm serious. All I was saying is I wish I'd known that you were doing that before I started. Yeah, that's maybe, <laughs> maybe you felt the same way. Yeah. That's a very interesting situation yeah. that basically in everybody parallel. thought yeah. there was nothing out there, yeah. let's do it. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's... Um, that's yeah, us exactly. So now you can talk. Um, but before you guys talk, or maybe not, but um, yeah, well, there is already somebody. I was hoping for that. Please. Uh, I arrived here and then I saw the Snowden archive Wi-Fi and I was delighted that I could connect on it and that I could browse once these uh, famous uh, archives. Uh, and then a bit later I thought like, oh, I'm going to check once on the network uh, and I do Avai Discover and I can see all the other people which are connected to that network. You were introducing that you use a Raspberry Pi, and then I thought mm, maybe I just try to log in once in the machine of, uh, uh, that you're carrying there. And I tried the default password, eh? pi at the IP address, and I try Raspberry, and I can connect to your box. Then uh, I think like, oh. Shit, I go to the downloads folder because I thought mirror, mirror, mirror on the wall. Eh, I take it in, I take it all, and I can distribute it somewhere else. Maybe in another archive, in another uh, GUI. And the downloads folder was protected. But then I thought like, oh, maybe I should try to go root. And I went root. Huh? To, mm, and uh, in that route, there was no password. And then if I go to the downloads folder, I can take it all. So I'm very interested in cryptography and in archives and in sharing archives. I'm interested in spies revealing documents. But of course, you have to also realize uh, once people are entering certain archives uh, and also redistributing them, that at least you have to somehow also uh, protect uh, their identities logging into uh, your uh, machine. So I was wondering whether we only talk about uh, reverse, uh, or that we can also talk reverse uh, crypto and not only like taking what the NSA was. Uh, uh, that's, uh, I don't know, I was a bit... Uh, <laughs> So please remove my MAC address because I don't know how to do that. No, I'm, I'm really happy that you did that. That's, <laughs> I, I left it open on purpose and to some extent because I, when I distribute it, I want people to be able to secure it in their own way. So everybody can have their own default, their own passwords, their own level of encryption that they want. It comes out open as is um, and with no guarantees like any other free software. Um, but you have a good point. I think if anybody runs it on any sort of scale, if they, they, they should protect it. I've left it open more or less on purpose. So if one of the goals of the archive systems is universality or additional use, what other document dumps have been made available through either of your archiving software? Well, the answer our case is, is none. I mean, we, uh, we are building this on Greenstone software, which is um, free and open source, has been around for a long time, and lots of other people have built many other digital libraries for, for many years now around the world. Um, but we have only done the Snowden documents and only the published ones at, at this point. Um, but that was enough for us, <laughs> frankly. But, but yeah. you, you have a different idea. So uh, we also made Icy Watch a database of intelligence communities of a, a database of resumes of people in the intelligence community. Um, also uses the same search software, Looking Glass, and we have some other databases that we're working on that use the same software as well. Um, that will hopefully be out at some point soon. And just to follow up, one of the ideas of the, of the in the box version of the archive was to sort of put an idea out there for people to do similar things with other archives, for instance, for parts of WikiLeaks to be distributed as their own standalone archive, so you can do research on a set of cables without having to go to the WikiLeaks site every time. 
Um, seriously cool panel, um, interesting. I love Transmedia, and I'd like to uh, particularly welcome John Young and um, Deborah. Um, because we're in a digital media festival, um, I'd like to ask this, this is more to Deborah and John. How do you think you can maybe reach out and inspire to other media workers, activists, artists, so we can have these kind of interesting crossovers? I really kind of was very intrigued by your introduction there. So this is kind of interesting that we should have you here in Berlin. And I think it's also very inspiring how we can have these interfaces crossing over. How do you see it here, like when you're coming to Berlin? The NSA has two major functions. One is spying and the other is counter-spying. Most of what they've released so far is about spying. They released, so far, the media's released very little about counter-spying, i.e. the tools we need to protect us from NSA. And we find this rather strange, because surely Snowden knows both. He, he trained as a spy and as a counter-spy, and every spy agency has both. And <clears throat> you can't have one without the other. And so that we're, we're crippled right now because we've got about 10% of the so-called total. It's nearly all about spying, but very little about counter-spying. We don't know if that's going to ever be released or not, because that's some of the most classified material they have, is how to prevent being spied upon. And so um, we're frustrated right now. We, we've been covering counter-spying most of our career in crypto. Uh, that's cryptography, uh, COPSEC of various kinds, and the technology of that. And we've received very little technology from these releases. We've had a lot of narrative stuff, mostly about civil liberties, and which is fine. That's what, probably what interests most people. The thing is, is that we can't protect our civil liberties unless we have the tools to do so. And before 911, we were getting a lot of material out of NSA about that. After that, it stopped, stopped dead, because they actually wanted to protect the American people by educating them with the technology against counter-spying, and they wanted to do that in a broad-based way. They since withdrawn from that uh, by command of people above them, primarily the military. So that right now we're. We on the counter-spying side, i.e. the technology side, are very frustrated that they're not releasing this. And what we heard is that they'll probably never release it because it's too classified. And um, however, we do think that what's going on now may increase public demand for counter-spying information because we really do need it, not against NSA, but against everybody else, including commerce people. We really do need to find some way to stop the acquisition of massive amounts of data by commerce and we don't have those tools. NSA has those tools. We've made a number of FOIA requests for it. They will not release it. And we think they're being negligent to the public by not releasing the tools we know are available. We know the companies have that technology, but it's too lucrative to sell it to NSA and not to the public. And so I think that what we're engaged in now is a public awareness of what's being done to you. And there is technology to stop what NSA is doing against us if we demand it, but if we don't even know it, if it's available, we won't do it. Deborah, um, may I ask you to perhaps go a little bit into um, the ideas behind uh, the clip, the 80 minute clip that we saw at the beginning? What kind of. Well, we are frustrated because there's a second secrecy regime in place at the moment. And that is a secrecy regime imposed by the stewards of Edward Snowden's cache. That is his media proxies who entered into an agreement with him that is, that is uh, somewhat obtuse, not well known by the general public, what was agreed to. At the moment, there is no transparency about the fullness of this archive. It's become very mystified, and the proxy agents are mum about it. Is it because Edward Snowden is negotiating a return to the US and the authorities have threatened his future prospects? If there are any more, more serious disclosures, perhaps of the sort John Young has mentioned, technological disclosures. So we find that we're at a moment where we're looking for another leaker from the proxy group to do a second uh, iteration, second generation disclosures to the public, to the public domain. 
there's a great reluctance to acknowledge the public domain and serve it with these taxpayer paid documents, which the NSA trove are ta paid by US taxpayers. False tallies, plus or minus false tallies, the piece you saw earlier. We choose to track two agents of state militaries spread 60 years apart and yet related to each other. And we position them as a literary uh, uh, device in this prisoner's di dilemma engagement with each other. And we track the extremely mobile activities of these two agents who as, in a sense, border and sovereignty enforcement agents for their re respective state militaries were mobile. Nikolai Khokhlov, of course, in his era, is moving around those Eastern European spots where he was always under alias, assuming an alias of a state not his own, and that was the game, the national state still with those strict borders, so your identity was state-bound. And then 60 years later, we see Edward Snowden also being shifted around the Beltway area and then abroad, and the scale is very different this time. And his aliases, he claims, he also worked under state alias. But now he's also participating in online social media during the 2000s in Ars Technica and others. And he begins to assign himself aliases. He's investigating his own, one can say, personhood through the ability that privacy allows you that per space for personhood. And at a certain point, just as Nikolai Khokhlov found a kind of geographic rupture when he was working in Karlshorst and then in Berlin, and his rupture of aliases occurs and he breaks through his own state military identity and <laughs> moves to, you know, breaks across the border to the west, so to Edward Snowden in Hawaii, that very geographically dis diffuse location, in the middle of the Pacific, that many Americans hardly consider Hawaii to even be American, we're already in the borderless mobility. He's already occupying this borderless, uh, uh, beyond sovereignty condition that the NSA's tools at the moment are trying to re-border, re-territorialize this post-territorial condition that we're in. And so he finally, in his own personhood, breaks through and starts assigning himself, not the state-derived aliases, but he calls himself the true hoo-ha early on. Then eventually we've got Verax, and we've got Cincinnatus, and we've got Citizen Four. He assigns those names to himself, and then eventually he ruptures and, and moves beyond in this post-state uh, identity. So we track all of that because now what? He's in Moscow. He has the prisoner's dilemma in a, in a sense that he cooperates with whom? He could cooperate for mutual benefit, but chooses, you know, game theory suggests he will not do so. He is, uh, he appears as a kind of uh, mechanical cyborg on, on these teleprompters at various conferences. Where is he? His trove is now in the hands of his media proxies, and it is under an opaque veil where there's time-released kind of proprietary material that's part of a supply-demand uh, economic model. They are, you know, Intercept and others, are, they've made money, they've published their books, they've made their movies, they've won their awards, but they continue to deny the, the public realm, the public sphere, the idea of the public domain. And so we look to a next generation uh, rupture to break open that trove. And when people say the, the, the uh, collection is incomplete, uh, indeed, and, and not searchable, well, it is incomplete. To what extent is not clear, but certainly we are in a very troubling lack of transparency at the moment in the so-called you know, independent media or even mainstream media. And we in this introduction you saw today, we address some of those issues in, in, in perhaps a, an oblique way, but we hope to have uh, cast some light into, into the, the current condition. 
Thank you very much. Um, are there any um, commentaries from the audience at this stage? Or do you guys um, feel like? Yes, John, please. Yeah. Well, you're in a perfect spot. The largest CIA station is in Berlin. It has been since the end of the Second World War. More. So Berlin has the largest collection of CIA agents in the world. CIA drives NSA. They set the targets for it. They bring in the intelligence. And so um, I'd be interested to see uh, what you could do in Berlin about this, because I think that we in America are trapped by law and by tradition and by patriotism. So we think it's going to come from the outside. We don't think it's going to come from inside the U.S. It's too lucrative to stay inside. We think it's outsiders who've got to bring this to a head and demand to see what else this Snowden archive contains. If not, then say we've got to encourage others to come forth with it and abandon Snowden. We think that right now he's in a terrific jam right now, and unless people demand there to be a change, there will not be a change. The releases have almost stopped. Now they're about once a month and they're getting more and more shallow and less informative and there's less to them. And so right now it looks like that either through negotiations, as Deborah said, with the USG to free Snowden, get an amnesty or a pardon, is it probably going to slowly die out. But not least of which it's no longer as lucrative as it once was. Very little of this is being shared with other media. It's almost totally contained with The Intercept right now. A so-called non-profit organization has tremendous financial backing and does not need to make money anymore. So they pretty much have cut off all other sources of publishing these documents. And now we know there's been tremendous interest in Germany for this material, but I think they have to ask for more. And I think that right now there's a terrific problem within Berlin that needs to be addressed by Berliners if, or other German people. And I think it just won't come from the inside of the United States. Over to Canada. <laughs> yeah, I guess I, I have... Um, something of a, a different view. I recognize that there are thousands and thousands of documents that he ha that Snowden handed over in Hong Kong that haven't been re released, and I share your concern that um, that over time, um, well, both the chances of of Snowden getting out of his uh, exile uh, um, or or um, are doing so safely anyway. Um, and also the chances of bringing the reforms that are desperately needed diminish over time. And certainly release of more documents and, and more publicity about them will, will greatly aid that. But for me, I think the, the biggest challenge is to take stock of what we already know. I mean, I'm, I guess I'm seeing the bottle here you know, half full. That we there's there is so much evidence out there of 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 illegality, of unconstitutionality, of at least um, a, a, a basis to to distrust um, these agencies, and that it's now our job, in a way, our job, uh, those of who are outside who have access to these documents, um, to to keep. The, the, the spotlight on, whether or not we get any more, um, because there's an abundance of evidence there um, to, to show that, that wrongdoing. And unless we can somehow um, you know, bring our agencies, our own governments, and I include the Canadian government here, who, which has got away with much more in the sense that they haven't been able, to, they've been not been forced to expose nearly as much as what's happened in the, in the U.S., unless we can get them to, um, uh, to become much more accountable um, and, and much more seen to be within the bounds of, of law, constitution, and democratic process, then, um, then in a way, the, the release of the Snowden documents will have had a perverse counter effect. That will, it will have normalized the embedding of, of you know, ubiquitous universal surveillance into the very communication infrastructure that we depend on, and we will have accepted that. It will be the norm. Um, and so far, that's what's, I think that's where it's headed. In the U.S., it was a lot of um, 
uh, of uh, Fuhrer about the, um, uh, the you know, the Patriot Act and rolling back at least some of the metadata collection, but that's about it. And the pressure to, for reform is dying out. In the, in the UK, um, there hasn't been any substantive changes. Um, and in Canada, what we've seen is the, the government recently, the previous government anyway, um, introduced a far more draconian and dangerous, um, arguably unconstitutional anti-terrorism act that gives relatively unfettered access to these, these things. So we've actually gone backwards. And we're basically, and we, I mean, I include myself, but, but, but collectively, um, un unless we do something you know, dramatic, it will have become the norm. Um, so um, it's, it's not just on the intercept and it's not just on the gatekeeping journalists at this point. I think it's on the, on the rest of us um, to, to act on what we've um, encountered um, and act in, in various different ways um, about holding accountability, of, of uh, forcing the kind of transparency that hasn't um, yet uh, happened. So, um, you know, in, in, in that sense, I'm, I'm not very optimistic. Um, but um, I think we need to lead with hope and we need to um, take advantage of what we have. Um. Thank you very much, Andrew. I see there is another question from the audience. My question is for John and Deborah. Uh, due to the overlapping programming here at uh, Transmedia Ally, I only saw about the, the last uh, quarter of the film or so, but it, it provoked a question in my mind. I'm Brian Holmes, by the way. Um, I think to be tracked, to be recorded, to be known and to be predicted is really to be contained as a person, you know? And I think that the incapacity to surprise the other is really the same as the incapacity to surprise oneself. That means to be able to invent oneself. That means to be able to be something other than what has existed in the past. And that's really a, a tremendous uh, lack that's, that's created by the existence of this uh, surveillance system. I think that in the past, during the Cold War, there was a period where this problem was recognized rather massively and there were many different aesthetic, political, psychic, psychological strategies that were developed to try to overcome that. I saw in the film a, a, um, such an attempt, as a matter of fact, by tracing the geography of control and tracing the, the formal structure whereby that, uh, that geography is exceeded and where, whereby uh, you know, positions within kind of topological structures of control are reversed. I'm wondering, two, I really have two questions for you. One, what are your thoughts about these kinds of aesthetic, uh, uh, psychic uh, and also mathematical strategies? And second, to, to what do you attribute the lack of such an aesthetics today? Because it's really very rare, despite, the, despite what, uh, well, what we have known for years, namely that uh, the structure of control that we live under now is every bit as intense as the one that marked the, the Cold War period. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that question, and it just uh, chills me and, and provokes me. And, you know, one hopes in the theme of this, these sessions over these number of days, conversation piece, conversation, that conversation is a portal to perhaps rage or more uh, robust forms of engagement, participation, uh, um, um, uh, an active position uh, and that as we both operate out, in, out of New York we look to the culture industry to get beyond the neoliberal cultural moment yeah, and start right. producing tools tools of the sort that you're suggesting were actually in an active uh, as an act, used as active verbs in, a, in that particular mo moment, that particular periodization, because too much cultural production is just a discursive 
uh, in entitlement and uh, uh, a kind of onanistic project that does not get beyond its own erotic pleasure of hearing the conversation. So I look forward to these sessions over these days to galvanize people into other modes of, of participation and engagement, as we've seen from these researcher and activists here who are really getting their toolboxes in order and uh, 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 offering them uh, to a, a larger uh, public. We can't end up in cultural dead ends, you know. It's very chic and hipsterish, but it's, you know, a death, a small death at, a, at an, ele you know, a very elegant death, admittedly, but, you know, uh -huh. we, we, we don't want to die just yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> thank you. thank you very much. This is, uh, I take this. Thank you. I take this as the closing word from the panel, um, uh, which I'm going to close right now. It was very, um, yeah, exciting uh, for me, and I hope for you, for you as well, to to be with us um, here tonight with uh, those, um, yeah, pioneers. Um, of, of archiving um, the snow leaks and of course also of researching around those issues. What I take um, home among many other things is that I think we are very much challenged uh, to um, deal with a variety of um, let's say temporal tracks yeah, we have on the one hand the material at hand that's already out there and this uh, um, material is taking time to be um, processed. It's, um, I don't know how many years, but it depends definitely on our um, yeah, ambition also to really process that material and to also um, politically also um, look for the necessary uh, implications, which is yet another uh, project for the rather, I would say, distant future. I, I would love to say for the near future, but I think it'll take a little bit of time to actually find the, the right political implications and to struggle for them, I mean. Um, and on the other hand, uh, which has been also um, uh, been raised on this, on this panel tonight, is this entire issue of that uh, of, of more than 80% or 90%? I don't know exactly how much of the actual leaks uh, that's that's that Snowden um, um, collected uh, is is still unpublished. So um, this is yet another temporal track uh, with with yet another uh, a variety of, uh, of of challenges um, awaiting us, and this is, I guess, this this kind of um, complexity that 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 we have to deal with, uh, rather than as just Deborah said, uh, uh, um, making it you know making it quiet uh, the quiet way and die. So yes, thank you very much for listening to us, and um, please. Um, please uh, keep in touch.